Hello, thank you. It's so wonderful to be on stage and see all of you lovely people. Uh, my name is Rachel Simone Weil. I'm gonna kick off this, the last day of NodeConf EU 2017 by talking about screensavers, obviously, uh, but also nostalgia and video games and also, of course, JavaScript, right? Screensavers, nostalgia, video games, JavaScript. Uh, does anyone out there like any of those things? Does it sound like a good topic? Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, so I want to give you a little bit of background. So when I was doing graduate uh, work at art school and later when I was teaching as faculty at the University of Texas, uh, I devoted myself to studying the history of video games and computers as well as our false memories of that history, right? So we have an English word for false memories uh, that is nostalgia. And uh, in school, I studied how culture shapes our history-making practices and how it shapes our nostalgia. Uh, for example, I found that video games that are perceived as being traditionally feminine or for girls uh, in their marketing are unlikely to be represented in video game databases, exhibits, articles, uh, and like nostalgic t-shirts and things like that, right? So why aren't cutesy, girly video games considered nostalgic? Is it because those games are bad? Is it because those games didn't exist? Uh, these questions were really interesting to me uh, in my graduate work, and so I explored them as an artist by making my own girly video game history and inventing my own nostalgia for things that didn't actually exist. So I made fraudulent games for girls uh, that looked like they were from the 80s, but were actually new. Uh, and they seemed fake, but they were actually real, right? So um, these are actually made in the way that video games were made back in the 80s. So on the left is Faxi's Unicorn Blast, which is sort of a side-scrolling shooter game. On the right is a love horoscope game called Electronic Sweet and Fun Fortune Teller. Uh, and both of these are written in 6502 assembly language and burn onto um, Nintendo Entertainment System cartridges. Uh, so a little bit about 6502 assembly. Uh, I taught myself assembly out of a book that I bought on Amazon in 2007. Uh, I had never written a single line of code before in any language. Uh, so this is my first experience in coding. Uh, so a little bit about the NES. If you don't know what an NES is, uh, here's a picture of one. Came out in 1985 in the US. I think maybe in Europe as well, 83 in Japan. Um, it has a 6502-like CPU, so um, called the Ryko 2803, so really similar internally to Commodore 64, um, Apple IIe, or Atari 2600. So if you're familiar with those game systems and computers, really similar uh, in inside. So I've been making these cutesy pie NES games for a couple years, and one cool thing that happened recently is um, they actually put Electronic Sweet and Fun Fortune Teller in a <laughs> Texas State History Museum as part of their video game exhibit, on, uh, their exhibit on video game history, uh, meaning that I literally had the opportunity to rewrite history, <laughs> which was great, right? Like, sometimes life is just so amazing, and I'm just so happy to be alive. Uh, I mean, like, not all the time, but sometimes I feel that way. Uh, so the reason I tell you all of this background, which has nothing to do with screensavers, I realize, but I'm getting around to it, uh, is that I wanted to give you a little bit of my perspective and my background and my approach to development. So while today I do work as an open source developer at Microsoft, mostly working in Node.js and machine learning, um, I don't always think of myself primarily as a developer, not just because I'm self-taught, but because for me, coding has always been a critical design tool to help me ask what if. And if the code doesn't do that, frankly, I don't find it that interesting. To me, it's like being interested in a paintbrush but not interested in art, or interested in a guitar but not interested in music. So let's get to screensavers. I wanted to take the approach that I um, put toward video games in graduate school and apply it to screensavers. I wanted to create screensavers in new formats, think about the nostalgia that we have or don't have for screensavers, and start asking what if questions. Um, and as I'll we'll talk about in a moment, I merged uh, both of my passions by creating a Node.js tool that allows you to create custom screensavers in the form of NES ROMs. So let's talk a little bit about screensavers. In 1989, uh, Berkeley Systems released a piece of software called After Dark uh, for Macintosh and later Windows, um, and it contained a number of screensavers, which at the time were actually kind of a newish concept. Um, the one you see on screen here is probably the most iconic screensaver from After Dark. This is Flying Toasters. If you haven't seen it, it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, toasters fly across your screen and pieces of toast. Uh, little white flapping wings, it's very adorable. 
for many of us, for me, I know the truly iconic version of this screensaver is not in color, but black and white, as it would have been seen on a late 1980s era Macintosh SE30, which was one of my first computers. It's about as old as I am, but you know, it was rescued from the trash, right? Uh, as a child, I was just absolutely mesmerized by After Dark. It was definitely my favorite thing to do on the computer. Each screensaver was like a little beautiful pixelated world that I just wanted to crawl inside of and live in. So I was really, really inspired by these. One cool thing about After Dark is you could actually customize each screensaver uh, with, a, with a control panel, um, which you see here. So you could do things like add custom messages or you could change the speed of the animation. Um, and so that was a really cool feature. I want you to actually take a good look at this control panel because we're gonna see it again in a couple minutes. Um, so I don't wanna be over dramatic, but I think screensavers are probably the most important factor in me becoming interested in computers. Like they were really that cool and powerful for me. They were also actually one of the biggest reasons I taught myself JavaScript, which was around 2014. So I'm outing myself as a relative newcomer to JavaScript and, and by extension to Node. Um, so at the time I was in art school uh, studying computer history, so I had to, of course, set up a PC in my studio running Windows 98, as you do. Uh, and one of my first orders of business was to get all my favorite screensavers on there from the 90s, uh, including this one, Sailor Moon. Uh, it dropped roses and crystals and pictures of Sailor Moon characters all over the desktop. Um, and I got it working on my Windows 98 machine. I somehow find, found this ancient file and managed to install it. And I thought, this is so cool. I wish I could share the screensaver with my friends, but I, I don't know how to share a screensaver from the 90s, and most people aren't running Windows 98 anymore, so mm, what do I do? And I thought, oh, this actually would be pretty easy to implement in the browser. And so I was like, maybe I'll teach myself JavaScript and figure this out. Uh, so I did that very thing. I'm gonna demo it real quick uh, so you can enjoy. The MIDI, so good. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, this is like my first foray into JavaScript. So it's actually just adding divs like a couple times a second. Uh, it's just like updating the DOM constantly, uh, which sounds like it might be a memory issue, but I think that the sound of the MIDI would probably drive you mad before you ever got that many divs on the page, that would be a problem. Uh, but yeah, this is like, I'm, I'm gonna cry. This is like my childhood right here, man, so good. All right, so now you, now you've seen what the power of screensavers, right? All right, so we'll switch back in here. Uh, after that, I made a couple other screensavers uh, for the browser. I'm not gonna talk about those. Um, Forever Crossing, Fun Dance. Lest you think I let the browser have all the fun, I started trying to make screensavers on OLEDs. I was really inspired by my colleague, Suze Hinton, who made OLED.js, which is a Johnny Five library for using uh, JavaScript to interact with OLED screens. Um, and so I actually just built a little web view on top of that that let you draw with the stylus and um, dump an image buffer from that. And of course, the next step was onion skinning, so you could use that OLED as a like, bona fide 2D animation surface for making screensavers, obviously. Um, so you know, some people say JavaScript all the things, I say screensaver all the things. I've been spending the past couple years doing just that. And like other things, but you know, screensavers. Um, so my most recent project, and the one I wanna go into some detail on today, uh, it combines my love of screensavers, and in particular After Dark, uh, with video games. So this is Alter Dark, um, and it lets you create custom screensavers that run on the NES, um, which is that original 8-bit Nintendo console I was talking about earlier. So you can actually um, download these straight from the browser, and you don't have to write any code at all, right? Um, I should say the user doesn't have to write any code. I had to write like a thousand lines of assembly language, but nobody else does, and so that's the thing that's really important, right? Um, so the user simply manipulates different settings and custom, uh, like, uh, you know, customizes different options here, and then um, you hit download, and you actually get an NES ROM downloaded to your machine, which you can run in an emulator, or you could run on hardware, right? So you could solder, um, you know, you could, you could burn uh, IC chips and solder them to an NES cartridge, or you could get a flash card or something like that. Um, so, Alter Dark is actually, um, it works, but it's a work in progress. Um, I've, it has bugs, uh, and I've actually never really shown it to anybody, so I thought maybe we could do a live demo on stage where I just show it to like a hundred people, a couple hundred people. That, that sounds fine, right? I'm sure that it will be fine and nothing will go wrong. So let's give it a try. All right, I have it pulled up here. Um, so obviously I had to bring in jQuery UI just so I can make this 
move. Uh, I was really drawing on the aesthetics of the old Macintosh, like System 7. Um, so basically, I know it's a little bit small. Let's see if I can maximize things here a little bit. Um, and being able to read it is not terribly important because I'll be narrating. But essentially, I have a couple of themes that I can choose from uh, here on the left. And then as I uh, choose a different theme, I get different options to customize that ROM. Um, so here, for example, Glitch World doesn't have a lot of customization options because the colors are going to be randomly generated. Um, I can't add any text because it's going to be very glitchy, but I could add some animation. So um, I'll add some hearts and I'll make them go slow maybe. And I'm just going to click download screensaver. Usually this is pretty, um, pretty quick. Oh, there we go. Great. So it's already downloaded to my machine. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up in an NES emulator. And let's see what we get. Oh, pretty cool. So we've got a sort of glitchy thing going on. And actually, these glitches are all randomly generated. So every time you download, um, if you hit refresh, it's actually going to use different random seeds. So you get a different randomly generated NES ROM, which is pretty cool. But this ROM will always look the same because it's based on the same code. Um, so let's try again with maybe some more customization. So I'm going to try this one. Um, you can actually change things like the background colors and some of the shape colors. Uh, I'll just play around with this a little bit. I like this color, yeah. Um, and I can actually add some custom text as well. So hello to my friends at nodeconf eu heart. And that's a little bit hard to read actually. Uh, so I'm gonna make it a little bit lighter and you can see that that actually updated live. Uh, and we'll add some aliens as well. That sounds fun. That was exciting. Ha ha! Pretty cool. Hello to my friends at NodeCon for you. Hi. <laughs> all right, cool. So, Alter Dark works. That's great. Uh, it's nice when your demos work. So, I want to talk a little bit about how exactly this works uh, and why I would want to build something like this. All right. So Alter Dark consists of a front end, a custom API written in Node.js and Express, and a customizable pre-compiled ROM. Uh, so the front end and API are actually both hosted in Azure. Um, this is my first time using an Azure API app, and I actually really loved it because I had the API working locally, and all I had to do was like check in that code to GitHub, connect it, you know, pretty much unmodified, connect it to this Azure API app, and in about two minutes, my local API was now a hosted API, and I had, you know, a custom endpoint, and cores config, and all of that cool stuff, continuous deployment, and it just works, which was frankly a miracle. Um, it's kind of pre-configured to know how Express APIs work, uh, and it's looking for certain things, so it goes into your package.json, it installs your dependencies, and things like that, so that was really handy. Um, and then the API also has access to a pre-compiled NES ROM that I wrote with the goal of having it be easily customizable. Um, so here's kind of how the API works. The API receives parameters in a GET request, right? And that's from the, from the client in the browser. Um, and so that request, this is like some pseudocode here, um, but it's saying like, hey, I have a ROM. Uh, I want you to modify this ROM called Alter Dark. Let's change the first color in the background palette to 3C. Let's set the animation speed to 2, things like that. Um, and then the API has access to this master ROM in which I hard-coded graphics and asset loading subroutines. So the API actually maps each incoming parameter, like for example, animation speed, to a memory address in the master ROM and then writes the new value to the specified address space. So essentially, this is an API that is patching a binary, right? So the parameters come in, the binary gets patched, and then it downloads uh, on the client. So um, we're gonna look at a little bit of assembly. I promise not that much. Uh, but for example, here are the palette bytes in the ROM right at the top of an eight kilobyte bank. Um, so I know exactly where this is in ROM, right? Like it's uh, 8,000, uh, 8,001, 8,002, 8,003. So it stands to reason if I overwrite these bytes which define the color palette, um, I'll actually get different colors loaded into the ROM. And um, just as a side note, these are not uh, like RGB or hex values, the NES kind of has its own color system like the Commodore or TI Basic would. Um, so this code here at the top of the bank is defining the palette, and later on in the assembly code, I've written a subroutine that uses color values referenced by this uh, variable named ADBGPAL. Uh, so this is basically writing to the NES's PPU, which you can think of kind of like a GPU um, for the NES. It has a separate chip aside from the 6502-based CPU um, to deal with graphics loading. 
Um, okay, so if you were closing your eyes at the assembly, you can open them again. We're gonna look at some JavaScript. Um, and this is really the heart and soul of the API, which is just stupidly simple. Um, really all I'm doing here is iterating through the parameters and mapping them to memory addresses. So I have a memory map somewhere else. It's just like a JSON uh, file that is just a straight up memory map. Um, and so I'm iterating through the parameters that come in through the API. Um, you can see this parse int memory map prop is the memory address, um, like the background uh, of a certain property like background color. And then the parse int new bytes prop is the actual value that should exist at that memory address. So when all of that is done, um, the API just returns a buffer. It's all just a bunch of bytes. And then you can download that as an NES file through the browser. So a little bit of reflection on the Alter Dark API. Of course, it's not perfect. Um, I've, I would say like it started working about three days ago. <laughs> so it was a really big risk to do this uh, talk. I've been kind of thinking about it, re-engineering it and re-engineering it um, and spent uh, a couple of weeks, um, you know, kind of coding on it. Um, it's not perfect. After I built it, I realized there's a better way to do it, right? Um, now that I've built the API, I'm thinking like, oh, I shouldn't actually be sending the byte, like one byte per parameter, because that's gonna get out of hand really quickly. Um, I should be able to send a string, right? That would be a lot more efficient um, instead of having a lot of parameters. Um, and also like error checking is all done on the web client. So like anyone who's slightly uh, like knows how APIs work could just go into Postman and just throw really weird bytes at uh, the API and who knows what would happen because I didn't do any error checking in the assembly. Uh, so that, that needs to be fixed, obviously, right? So there's some issues. Um, but my motto really, uh, the way that I do development is good ideas done quick. Um, spend time on the idea because the implementation can always be iterated on. Um, one of my favorite things to say on a project is like, oh, that, that feature will be trivial to implement. Uh, I know that's like famous last words, uh, but I say that a lot because I spend a lot of time thinking about a project and a little bit of time just getting the first, uh, the first pass out the door, right? I used to be an editor, so I'm all about the, getting the first pass out. You can always go back and revise it. Uh, but there are a couple things I think are actually pretty cool about the Alter Dark API that I want to share with y'all. Uh, so first of all, it can allow users to create their own graphics theoretically, right? So Customizing the ROMs that I've given you is kind of cool, but like what if you don't want the shapes or you don't want the glitch world or you don't want the princess castle? It's kind of limited. Um, but in theory, just as we're overwriting palette bytes, we could overwrite graphic tile bytes. We could overwrite music bytes, right? Any static data with a known memory address can be overwritten. So think about a video game. You have an initial number of lives. There's, you know, whatever the title screen looks like. Um, you have, you know, are the enemies visible or not? Um, all the initialization data, meaning things that are in ROM, not RAM, because that's obviously not persistent, um, can be modified. And the nice thing here is that um, there are already graphic and music creation tools out there. So this actually is kind of trivial to implement, um, letting users uh, upload their own graphics. So not only can they add their own custom messages, they could add their own, you know, take a, a photo of yourself and convert it to, uh, four bit color and then you know kind of put it in the ROM. Those things are actually pretty easy with this API because it's just getting bytes and memory addresses. And if you know if you've got the bytes and you know the memory addresses, it's actually pretty trivial to do that over this API. Um, and it will work for any ROM, not just mine, right? So I made Alter Dark and I made it sort of intentionally customizable, um, but it would really work for any NES ROM. I'm not saying you should download NES ROMs illegally. Let me just be clear about that. Um, and actually not just NES ROMs, but any binary, right? As long as you know the memory address and the new byte that you want to overwrite, um, this would work. So the concept of a binary patching API I think could have some interesting applications. I looked around to see if uh, there was another web API like this and I couldn't find one, um, but I can think of other applications like maybe um, overwriting ping data programmatically without using image magic or I, I don't know, I think there's some possibly interesting applications. If you have some ideas, like I would love to hear them. Uh, so please come talk to me later. Uh, but I think the two things that were most important for me for creating uh, Alter Dark were one, thinking of it as a learning tool for those interested in NES development. So retro gaming is really popular. Um, people, you know, when I sh have shown my work in the past, people are like, oh, this is so cool, how did you learn? It's hard, like, it, uh, I hate to say it, it is hard. 
Um, it's hard to get into, and there aren't a lot of simple pathways into NES development. In fact, it's somewhat of a point of pride for the NES developer community to say like, oh yeah, it's really hard, you probably shouldn't even bother. Uh, <laughs> and that can be really discouraging. I know it was discouraging for me. Um, so I don't wanna maintain any of those barriers, um, and I I'd love to dismantle them, actually. Um, and so right now, as you guys uh, saw in the demo, the API exports a compiled binary that runs in an emulator or on hardware, but um, there's no reason it couldn't actually just spit out source code, at least for Alterdark, uh, because I have the source code and it would be um, trivial to implement, right? Instead of overwriting the bytes, you could overwrite bits of the source code, and then it becomes a really interesting learning tool um, for people to say like, oh, let me change the colors and see how that changes the binary, and let me see how that changes the source code. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and then finally, something that I'm really super passionate about is that this API is an opportunity to allow anyone to author their own video game history. So, you know, diversity is really important in communities like this one, in the Node.js community, um, but often our histories aren't as diverse because the creators decades ago aren't, um, don't represent the diversity that our communities do today. And so when creators aren't as diverse, um, sometimes their creations aren't as diverse. And in the case of video games from the 80s, we had a lot of games about racing and sports and male action heroes, and all those things are great and cool, um, but they're not necessarily like the things that I would have made um, if I had been a creator, and you might be able to tell that because I really like princess castles and hearts and cute things like that. Um, so I think this tool gives us a, kind of an opportunity to reimagine what video game history might have been like with more diverse creators at the helm. Uh, and I think that's actually a pretty cool um, outcome from this. So if you guys wanna try it yourself, uh, <laughs> I haven't super officially released Alter Dark yet because there are, are a few front end uh, bugs related to the colors. Sometimes the color um, menu has some weird issues. There are a couple bugs. I, I wanna make the source code a little better. I was really, really quick and sloppy with it. Uh, so it looks, it looks quite bad. I'm gonna go fix it on the plane back to Austin, Texas. Uh, so I'd love to keep this in the NodeConf EU family for a couple days uh, until I fix those bugs, but I know what's gonna happen. Someone's gonna tweet this, and I'm gonna fly back home, and I'm gonna have an email from Motherboard that's like, we wrote an article about your really bad code. Maybe if you wanna share it, like, please feel free to. Um, and the title of the article will just be like, local woman tries to code or something. <laughs> It's actually happened to me before, what do you do? Um, please uh, do check out the demo, uh, understanding that it's in uh, like alpha or beta uh, version. Um, and I've also got the source code for the API up on GitHub as well, github.com slash alterdark. Uh, so I wanna leave you guys with one other thing that I learned from this project, uh, more so than like how to host the API in the cloud or how to deal with reading binary files in Node. Um, so this is a picture of screen burn. Um, some of you might be too young to have ever seen this in person, um, but it's actually the reason we ever had screensavers in the first place, right? Screensavers were literally saving your screen um, because uh, the image, if it were on the screen too long, could, could literally get burned into the CRT. And so screensavers were constantly repainting your screen with animation. Uh, so this is an arcade monitor with the first level of Miss Pac-Man burned in. Um, screen burn is not really a problem for us so much with contemporary monitors, but more importantly, we actually have the technology now to turn off our mo monitors entirely uh, when, they, when our computers have been inactive for a certain amount of time. Um, so, so we actually really shouldn't use screensavers at all uh, because they're keeping our monitors on and consuming energy. Um, I had this realization that screensavers are actually really bad. Uh, like, they're bad for the environment and I feel bad. This is so devastating for me to realize because I spent years being like, screensavers are so cool. And then I was like, oh my God, they're killing the rainforest, right? Uh, the whole reason I became interested in computers was screensavers and After Dark and this weird Windows 95 brick maze thing. I loved this. Uh, you know, like, so how do I reconcile my love and nostalgia for screensavers with the fact that like they're killing the planet? That's tough, right? Uh, and so I think it's an important reminder to always question the past, uh, to question your own nostalgia, and even the things that you loved, that inspired you, that got you to where you are. Um, and to acknowledge that those things might not line up with your values that you have today, and that's okay. Um, they might be in Twitter vernacular, problematic faves, 
Um, we don't have to throw out all of our histories and all of our fond memories, but I urge everyone here to examine history with the same sort of kindness and intellectual rigor and challenge um, that, that history really deserves. And by all means, if you get the chance, just rewrite history completely. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>